I'd like to preach to you tonight the second part of the message this morning, false teachers among you, or you can call this message the beast, the donkey, the dog, and the pig. Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter, please. The beast, the donkey, the dog, and the pig. Yeah, that's right out of the Bible. You're going to see that. All of those animals tonight. 2 Peter chapter 2, please. 2 Peter chapter 2. Before we begin tonight, let's go to uh, the Lord in a word of prayer and ask him to clear our minds and our hearts. Father, it is a blessing to be able to come to your word again and to preach the word. And Lord, I'm, I'm excited and, and uh, giddy today to be here. And uh, Lord, it's, you know, in the flesh, Lord, we like snow days and all of that, but it gets awful old. And it's so nice to be with the people you've given us to live life with. It's so nice to be here laying uh, our, our labors at your feet and to be serving you and to be worshiping here together and to be singing those incredible songs that we just sang. Thank you for music, Lord. What would our hearts be without being able to sing about you, Lord? We, we would just be sad and we would have just inadequate expression. Thank you for music. And Lord, I just want to ask you that you would let the word of God run, Lord, tonight. I pray that the, the scriptures, Lord, would be fully um, exposited. I pray that the people of God would love the scriptures. Lord, we love you and we need you. And uh, one of these days, we're going to walk right into your presence. And Lord, we will never sleep again and we will never die again. And uh, we're so looking forward to it. Let the people of God rejoice. Let our, our dead and dry bones tonight, Lord, live. Let us love the word. Let us be moved by the word, Lord, in encouraged and and that you would be made big lord here among us we love you in jesus name amen this this morning we identified and we called out many false teachers and by the way i want to appreciate you uh, i appreciate you coming back tonight even if i may have picked on someone that you've watched on tv or whatever like that i'm so glad that you're still here well, we made direct applications from 2 Peter chapter 2 and simply connected the dots. And I, I want to just comment a little bit about calling false teachers out by name because there, there's a, serve, a, a certain misconception that it shouldn't be done. That pastors who do this are mean and uncaring somehow and they should just mind their own business and oh, no, no, we should not. You know, that would be great if it weren't for the Bible. If it weren't for the New Testament that calls out in epistle after epistle people who were against the gospel, all right? People who were false teachers. This is a biblical thing. The whole idea of it being unloving and unethical or something to call out false teachers uh, from a pulpit by a pastor is a bogus thing. It's not, it's not biblical. It's not right. In the epistles, the enemies of God are called out by name. We are so warned about false teachers and false influence that there's nothing to do but call them out by name. We are told in Romans 16, 7 to mark them. How do we mark them if I'm supposed to be so vague here to, on this pulpit that you, ever, you actually never know who I'm talking about? I have to be specific. If I could warn you without calling out, out names, I suppose that I would do it. But I cannot risk being so vague that you would not understand who the scriptures are talking about in our generation. You know, we are told to separate from false teachers. We are told not to tolerate false teachers but, and to fight against false teachers in obedience to Scripture. We need not be ugly and nasty about separating, but we definitely need to, to practice what the Word of God says and call them out and to call out heretics as we did this morning as we'll continue tonight. One thing that I told Rob, though, uh, coming in here tonight, in messages like this, I want you to understand that we don't stay here. There are some ministries that make their whole ministry out of what they're against. I want to make the ministry, and you want to make the ministry of Lighthouse Baptist Church about what we're for, who we're for. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a promise, and what a hope that he is going to give us eternal life, and that he will come and lead us and guide us, and that he's not ashamed to call us brethren, and that he has forgiven our sins, and his blood makes us to have all the hope in the world. Okay, we want to be about what we're for, not a ministry just always about what we're against. But there are times, as we preach expositorily, that we must make application of what God is against. I want to also make very, very clear that false teachers, heretics, as verse number one says, 
uh, are those that choose opinions. That's actually the word heretic. Some of you were not here this morning, and that's fine. <laughs> that's a little joke, insider joke from this morning, if you were here. Um, you were not more spiritual because we were here and you weren't here. Yeah, that was this morning. All right, so, so the word heretic means to choose an opinion or to choose a choice uh, of teaching, of doctrine, really against what the scripture says. And heretics uh, share. You know, they're not, they may never be official teachers, but they share. So heresy is spread. So that's what heresy means, to choose a doctrine or an opinion that contradicts scripture. Heretics, so we need to understand what are not heretics, okay? Heretics are not other pastors and churches that we may have different worship styles uh, than, okay? You often hear from this pulpit, me praying for other churches in our area, okay? Those are not, because they have different preferences and maybe would not practice some things that we would practice and we feel like that that's not what we should do, whatever. That doesn't make them heretics. Heretics contradict the doctrines of scripture, you know, heretics are not someone that may listen, for instance, uh, to up, more upbeat Christian music than you do personally. Uh, they are not someone who has different standards in their home or, or a different, someone from a different denomination, okay? You know, heretics are not everyone who, who their, you know, in their church name doesn't have the word Baptist, okay? I hope you understand. You do understand that, right? Please understand that, all right? Heretics are those that oppose Bible doctrines, that choose opinions and spread opinions that are not Bible doctrines. Doctrines, heresies, are those who choose and, 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 and violate clear biblical doctrine. Would you stand, please, as we go into the next part of our message? Second Peter chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse number 19, because that is the, the key, the climax. If you, if you make notes in your Bible, you ought to star or draw a little key by verse number 9. It is the key to the passage. So verse number 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations but to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And now we begin in verse number 12. But these, still talking about heretics, false teachers, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall, those are spiritual things, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. <laughs> Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Look up here. I'll allude to this just a little bit, but in the early church they had fellowships. They had uh, agape feasts, or love feasts, where they would come together, and they would spend time together in love and feasting together. These are say, you know, the scripture here in verse 13 says, they are, they, are, uh, they are messing up your love. They are messing up, they eat with you in these feasts, but they are sporting their own deceivings while they mix and mingle with you. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable so souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. We saw that from this morning. I believe it's verse number three. Cursed children, who, which have forsaken the right way and, gone, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a, a tempest, to whom the mist, look at this phrase, what powerful phrase, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Wow, that is super beautiful, but very scary and fearful language. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, remember we saw their feigned words uh, earlier this morning, in verse number, what is it? Verse number one, they're plastos, they're plastic words. They mold these words to take advantage of people. Verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they, these are people who follow them, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, this, this, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. 
For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that is washed, the pig that is washed, to wallowing, to her wallowing in the mire. You may be seated. Did all of you catch the beast, the donkey, the dog, and the pig? We continue to look at the attributes tonight of false teachers with the promise that God will deliver the godly out of the temptations of false doctrine, but will bring great destruction on false teachers. I want you to continue tonight to notice in verse number 12, their purpose, their purpose. We, we laid out several things. Was it three or four things this morning about their character and other things, their teachings, whatever they're following? Well, notice their, their purpose in verse number 12. The Bible calls them natural brute beasts. Look at 12. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Imagine natural brute beasts. These are not just like cows that were made to to provide meat because there's a profit there, right? I like beef. Don't take away my beef. Amen? Barbecue, amen? Spare ribs, things like that. These are like hyenas. You don't eat them. They're brute beasts. They're, they're, they're things that destroy. A wolf, maybe, or, or those wild boars that steal sheep, that, that, that hurt livestock, that damage crops. Generally not good for anything except shooting. That's what they're good for, shooting. So are false teachers that influence the people of God, whether it be by entering the local church, we talked about this morning, or writing books or podcasts or televised teachings, disrupting Sunday school classes, opposing pastors, etc. God says they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. That sounds very harsh, but they are the enemies of God and his people. And God says they're only good for one thing, to destroy. They get no mercy, folks, because they are the enemies of God and the enemies of the gospel. They had a time, there was a time at the beginning where they heard the knowledge of the Lord. We see this a little bit later. But they rejected his mercy and they went their own way. They created their own religion, as it were. Their own mixed with Jesus kind of religion. And false teachers that infiltrate had a time of mercy, but that, that mercy passes when they, when they begin influencing against God and against his gospel. The verse says, notice that they, are, they speak evil of things that they understand not. Many of these, perhaps not all, are unbelievers, and they they are thinking in the natural mind. You know, they're not saved. They're not regenerate. They're not born again. So they're doing Christianity through the natural mind, though they say that they have the words of God, and they even present themselves as if they know more than you, or as if they have deeper understandings than you, or they have scholarly understanding. They don't really understand the gospel and the things of God. They're, in, they're unsaved. They're in their natural mind. Think about the Judaizers in the early church, professors of Christianity, and that wanted to bring in the law. I talked to you a bit about them this morning. They didn't understand salvation by the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. They didn't figure out that Jesus was enough, that you don't have to add to that. You don't have to help the blood of Jesus Christ. It is sufficient. They wanted to add the works of the law. They spoke evil of salvation by grace alone. And this is the verse here. They speak evil of things that they don't even understand. There was a man in my ministry many years ago, several years ago, I should say, that represented himself as a great defender of God's word. You would think that he really loved God's word. However, he was harmful and hurtful to the church. And he confronted me one day uh, after a sermon because I had said something like this. God does not love believers more based on their performance. His love is fixed on them because of Christ, all right? Do you understand that statement, all right? God does not love people, does not like believers more when they do better or they do worse or love them less when they do less. His his love is fixed on them. It is a determined, graced love through Christ. He loves them as he loves Christ. That is grace. That is salvation grace. Well, he didn't like that very much, and this guy confronted me it's actually out here in the hallway after the service he was a legalist that thought that God should love people more if they did such and such and of course that such and such was what he thought that they should do and that God's love was determined by how much you can perform for him or 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 do or or please him by your works 
you know, this is what this verse is talking about. False teachers speak evil of things that they don't understand, even though they're good doctrine. They will often come down on the wrong side of Bible doctrine because they have natural minds, not spiritual regenerated minds. They're arguing doctrine and they're producing their own choices and opinions from a natural, unsaved mind, not a spiritual mind. I want you to notice their damage in verse 13 and 14. Notice their damage. It says, and they receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that, that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children. Do you, do you pick up from this passage that maybe God is not very happy about heretics? I mean, just he's banging on them over and over. He's warning us about danger, the danger of them. And the, he's warning, or he's telling us about their incredible destruction that has come. Notice their damage. False teachers and influencers are like those, the Bible says here, verse 13, that riot in the daytime. Riot in the daytime. Why, what does that mean? They're not ashamed of the damage they are doing. You know, there's one thing where, where when a guy like, like robs a house or does something like under the cover of night, whatever, because he is ashamed, he doesn't call it whatever. It's a whole other thing when a guy is doing open crime in the middle of the day. There's something broken in the man's thinking. They are callous and they are unconscious to the hurt, the damage that they are doing to the body of Christ. They're not ashamed of it at all. They're like rioters in the daytime. Verse 13 calls them spots and blemishes. I think of the word graffiti. You know, people spray painting walls or whatever. You know, this is what they are doing to the church and the unity of believers and the love of the believers. Jude also uses this description of them, spots and blemishes. Spots on your feasts of charity, Jude says. That's the love feasts I told you about, the fellowships in the early church. These people, these, these false teachers were infiltrating holders of doctrines that were against Bible doctrine, you know, the same as those who, who could, could, could come to our church. And they mix and they mingle and they may even join or whatever, but they are like graffiti, nasty graffiti on the genuine fellowship and love of believers. They are graffiti. They are like spray paint walls, you know, on something, a beautiful facade that now is just messed up with graffiti. Dear saints of God, how many I've seen in the in this world that would fit into the description and being a pastor would fit into this description of, of those that damage true love and unity. It is so obvious that Satan stirs up these spots and blemishes to molest the Christ-like love in a church. It's, a, it's sad and it's a shame and we should not tolerate it. But the, the Bible in verse 14 warns you even stronger about them. It goes, it steps it up in verse 14. So verse 14 says, they have eyes full of, what, adultery, that they cannot cease from sin. Think about that a moment. They cannot cease from sin, right? By the way, that's evidence that they're not true believers. They don't have the power of the resurrection in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them, okay? Beguiling stable souls, verse 14, heart exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. This seems to be altogether one thought, and the word to put on this could, would be predator. Predator. Okay? Eyes full of adultery, cannot cease from him, or from sin, beguiling stable souls, heart exercised with covetous practice, cursed children. This describes a predatory nature in these folks that uh, are consumed and maybe even be consumed with getting involved in illicit, impure affairs within a church. I don't, want to raise, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to think, how many of you are aware of situations or have been in churches that were almost destroyed or maybe destroyed, or people's lives that were destroyed by illicit adultery that happened within the church? Okay, that's not a random thing that happened here, there. Okay, this is part of chapter 2. This is something that Satan is doing. This is, this is particular temptation through, you know, 
false teachers. And again, I warned you this morning that false teachers aren't those that advertise. They're not those that get some position necessarily in, in the church. They're just influencers. Again, I'm so sad to tell you of many situations that I know where this has occurred in great churches just like ours. And this begins to introduce us to a very, very dark side of false teachers and influencers that we'll see even stronger in verse number 18. They are fleshly. They are covetously dirty, unholy, even while teaching and influencing in the name of the Lord. They may come and they may appear and they may hobnob with you and talk to you in, in the local church as if they love Jesus or whatever. But there's a very dark side to them, The chapter 2 says here. Their private heart cannot cease from sin, it says. They draw others into their sin and God calls them cursed children. Pastor Josh's father, David Kennedy, Dr. David Kennedy, is well known among pastors for many things, but one of them is cleaning up a horrendous sexual scandal that occurred in one of the flagship Baptist churches in America. Just an amazing ministry, a wonderful work of great history, but this happened there. And Dr. Kennedy came afterward and just had to spend years cleaning up uh, the, the, the terrible moral uh, and legal repercussions that happened because of the description of verse number 14. Folks, this stuff happens in churches. And don't think just because you love Lighthouse Baptist Church that it couldn't happen here. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Beware. We pray for God to protect Lighthouse, but we need to stand on guard about influences this way. You need to protect yourself in verse number 14. You know, uh, you know, we're told to greet each other with a holy kiss in Scripture. But it's a holy kiss. You know, I, I'm from West Virginia, and uh, we fought with the North, but there's a lot of Southern thinking in, uh, in West Virginia. And uh, frankly, because of what I've seen in the ministry, I'm just not comfortable with touchy-touchy feel-good. You know, I, I think that we need to respect proper boundaries of marriages and ages and the appropriateness of treating, you know, ladies like, our, like holy sisters. And, uh, you know, when a lot of those uh, walls and personal, you know, uh, boundaries are relaxed, you know, even in a church, bad junk can happen. Guard yourself. Guard our church Guard against verse number 14 in every way. Notice, please, their responsibility in verse number 15 through 17, their responsibility. It says, uh, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Abazar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. Uh, clouds are, uh, which are, that are carried away with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Please, parents, explain to your children on the way home that Pastor Whitmer was not cussing from the pulpit. Appreciate that. Notice their responsibility. What stands out to me here is the knowledge that these false teachers and influencers, insert, uh, influencers are, have, and yet they continue to influence for the wrong without fearing the Lord. The Bible says they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. So what you understand from this is that they used to know what was right. They've forsaken that right way. There was a time where they had the choice of understanding clearly the gospel and following in the doctrines of the Lord, but they've turned away from that. They once knew what was right, what was wrong. They are personally responsible for their choices. And I think that this indicates in most cases they know what they're doing. They're like Balaam, the false prophet in the Old Testament who took bribes to, to prophesy in the name of God, and God used a dumb donkey to confront that dumb donkey for his own madness. You remember that story? They're like him, craziness. So it is with those who would twist God's doctrine and hurt churches for their own profit, to get something out of it, to merchandise people, to get a following, uh, something that they are receiving you know, from the craziness of what they're doing, like Balaam who was paid off in bribery. And I've often wondered, as I've said, that if these wolves know that they're hurting the cause of Christ, it seems to me that verse 15 indicates that they do know. And they keep on doing it. They do not realize the destruction that is coming. Verse 17 calls them dry wells. You know, a well of water, like dipping water. 
the dry wells. They are, they are clouds blown around in the tempest, the scripture says. In a storm, they're just blown around in the tempest. And again, we see their predicted destruction worded a little bit different way. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Wow. Friends, how sweet it is to be a Bible literalist who loves the simple doctrines of the faith. How wonderful it is to be supportive of clear doctrine and not be an influencer and not be a feigned aplastos, someone who molds doctrine to fit what you want to say and your opinion and what to think and to influence others. How wonderful it is to be a Bible literalist. Hold to the clear, fast, orthodox doctrines of the faith. Love them. It's safe ground. I do not want to end up in the midst of dark, the mist of the darkness, that is bad stuff, the scripture says. Finally, see more of the attributes of their character. You add these on top of verse three and verse 10 that talks about their character. And I'll read the last part, verse 18 and following. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who lived in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom uh, a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. But if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse uh, with them than the beginning. For it would have been better uh, for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it... This happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I read all these verses in a chunk because I believe what we're seeing seeing here describes a specifically fleshly kind of teacher that was touched on just a second ago in verse number 14 and we talked about this morning. Notice in verse number 18, they, they speak great swelling words of vanity. You, you understand? It's like a word picture. They're like, oh, these wonderful things. And, you know, people pay attention. And they're interesting. And, uh, you know, there are some that can be accused within conservative circles. They like to try to find messages and sermons that they preach that, that no one has ever heard before. There's a problem with that. It's a problem if you know the word and you've been sounding the word for 25 years and you hear a guy preach on a doctrine you've never heard before. There's a problem because there's nothing new under the sun. All right? The word of God doesn't, you know, wonderfully whatever. <clears throat> you may remember some time ago, and I don't believe he's a false teacher at all, but I, I use this illustration because you've got to be careful. You remember a man that came in here when I was away, and uh, this was year, a couple years ago, and he was an evangelist, and he preached on a message about when, when the scriptures talk about that the father turned his back on the son on the cross and Jesus said, um, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said that that doesn't mean that God the father turned away from the son. It's just talking about the nature, the two natures of Jesus Christ. I don't know if any of you remember that, all right? What the man said, he was trying to be new and different, whatever. He was absolutely wrong. He's not read Isaiah 53 evidently. All right, and it proves, you know, it pleased the, the father to bruise him. I called the man on the phone and I showed him his wrong teaching. You know, you can't just want to say something new with these wonderful swelling words so that people will think that was a good sermon. We must preach the word. And beware of those who have these great swelling opinions and words and things that you really feel like you haven't seen before or whatever that are almost extra biblical. Something's wrong there. They allure, the, the verse says, through the lust of the flesh. Well, what is going on here? What's it talking about, to allure through the lust of the flesh? I believe that this is talking about a very, very popular expression of Christianity that is in our culture that was alive back there as well. We can see in, verse, in, in the church of Corinth that it was a very fleshly church. And they were, you know, they were saying stuff like this. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. You know, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and own husband, whatever. And by the way, teenagers and singles here, it's still good for a man not to touch in a way that kindles a fire a woman, unless you're married to her. 
And then throw gas on the fire if you're married to her. Amen? See, it's exactly the opposite. That fleshliness, I think, is what we see here. That there's this weird and strange heresy that will mix fleshliness with Christianity. Their messages are, are vanity. They are empty of the word of God and doctrine. And what goes along with this kind of, you know, swelling, you know, kind of fleshly uh, messages and preaching is a ministry that is fleshly and where, check this out, holiness is missing. You have churches and ministries that are preaching the word and doing Bible studies and having crazy, you know, wonderful social impact on feeding people, the poor, whatever, whatever, but the idea of holiness is totally missing from the ministry. The putting off of sin and the putting on of a lifestyle of Jesus Christ, of obedience and purity, is like, is like gone. It's not even there. They promise liberty, verse number 19, but they are really enslaved to the flesh it's talking about. In our culture and even in our town of Newark, there are very popular churches that feed on the flesh and draw people to a fleshly kind of Christianity. And that's very appealing to Toby's flesh. That I can please the flesh and please God too? I mean, that's like you having your cake and eat it too. I mean, who wouldn't want to go after that? You can satisfy both of your natures. There's no repentance of sin emphasized. There's no holy living emphasized or defined. There's no mortify the flesh with the affections and lust and put on Christ. There's no calling out the people to righteousness and holiness and a pure lifestyle. It is a sort of bring fleshly baggage and we as Christians will live together in our fleshly baggage kind of message. We are all sinners, so let's just work in this together rather than the Bible message of receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, put on Christ, die to flesh, turn your back on flesh, kill the flesh, mortify the flesh daily. That's the message of the New Testament. It's not let's all carry around our baggage together. Let's stay in our sin where Jesus found us. Let's return to our sin where Jesus found us. Characteristics of this fleshly teaching and ministry would be the lack of any church discipline or confrontation of those within the accountability of the membership that are living in sin. You know, this church, <coughs> you know, it, and it's been all usually positive, but it's often been noted because through our history, you know, in 14 years, we have disciplined several people out of our church publicly. We have gone, done the right thing. We've gone to them. We've begged for them to repent. We've, you know, we've, we've ramped it up and taken spirit deacons, other deacons like, along with me, and begged for them to turn away from their unrighteousness and stop living in, in, in open sin or, you know, in willing sin, whatever. But in the end, we've disciplined people out of this church, just like the Bible says. Well, you got ministries now where you can live like the devil and be a member of the church and everything's great because we're all just carrying our baggage together. Moral issues of living together or drinking or divorce or gay marriage, etc., are never addressed. So this is how that sounds directly from one of these churches' websites right here in, in Newark, Delaware. Okay, this is copy and paste right off the website. Real church for real people. Come as you are and be who you are. We're not interested in cramming anything down your throat. We just want to tell you more about Jesus. That is a quote. And cramming anything down your throat is AKA for confront you about your sin. We're not going to press anything. How can, how can I be a pastor and, and not present things to you as commands of the Lord God. I am unprofitable as a servant. I should be stripped of my position if I don't challenge you and confront your personal sin. I'm a charlatan. That's straight, that's a quote ripped right off the website. When I looked through one of this church's <laughs> website, it was very interesting to me that many fleshly Hollywood celebrities and, and movies and artists that scripture would rebuke are referenced on the website. 
they're applauded, these celebrities. Hollywood celebrities on the website. They're accepted. They're enjoyed. There's a major disconnect here from Christianity and fleshliness. There's, there's, there's something broken here. There's something broken. It's, it's the verses here of those that would call you to a Christianity in the same time enslaving you in fleshliness. There's something weird going on in our world, in our country, concerning Christianity. A Christianity that doesn't call you to holiness is broken. It is not like Jesus. Did, did anyone notice that Jesus is pure? Has anyone noticed when we say following Jesus that he's holy and sinless? And that he calls you to the same? That he says stuff like go and sin no more after he saves people? Has, ha, have we missed this? How can I offer someone Jesus without confronting sin? It's an impossibility. Look at verse 20 through 22, scan them. We've already read it. This is not describing saved people. Although the language, look at verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. This is not the only place that the word of God talks like this with such tension. Okay? These are people that are not saved. They're not believers. But they have come all so close. They have the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. They understand the gospel. But in the end, they turn away. And they turn back to the things that Jesus Christ would have saved them from. All so close. But the dog returns to the vomit and the pig goes back to the pig pen after it's washed. To the mire. This is a, describing a certain sect of false teaching in greater Christianity that knows about the message of Jesus Christ that would save them from the pollutions of the world, but they hold that knowledge and return to the fleshly sinfulness and the entanglement of sin, like a dog returning to vomit or a washed pig. The end, the scripture says, is worse than, they had ev than if they had never ever known the way of righteousness. You say, how could that, how could that be? Because with the knowledge of the gospel comes a responsibility of accepting the gospel. And to come so close, you know, I'll just throw it out here. I believe in degrees of hell. I believe in, in degrees of punishment. And those, you know, if someone doesn't receive Jesus Christ, though they've never heard the name of Jesus Christ in some country, some deepest dark parts of Africa, you cannot go to heaven without knowing who Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is and accepting him as your Savior. There is no other w roads. And so that's why you, you send missionaries. That's why Mission Emphasis Month. Have compassion on these people who've never heard about Jesus Christ. All right? However, someone like that who, who, who is, you know, because... They never had a chance to hear whatever. They're still going to go to hell. I strongly believe because of some other passages of scripture that their punishment is going to be better if there is such a word in hell than those who had, who sat in a Baptist fundamental church and heard clearly the gospel and hobnob in the gospel and knew the gospel and turned back to their own vomit, their own sinfulness, their own slavery to fleshliness. And did not accept Christ as Savior and demonstrate it by righteousness and obedience and following Christ the rest of their life. It's a sad thing. Their end is worse than if they had never known the way of righteousness. And this is God's conclusion about what salvation really is and really what is not. True salvation delivers a man and changes that man into the image of Christ. It does not offer him forgiveness of sin and then lead him back to sin and fleshliness. Any leader or church or ministry that does not compel believers to holiness is a false teaching heretical ministry. Any ministry content to leave believers in their sin without teaching them to put off sin and put on Christ is an enemy of the gospel, not a friend of the gospel. And I want to be ugly, but we are called to be discerning. And having a, at least they are preaching the gospel kind of attitude toward these teachers is not the right attitude. They need to be called out and marked. I want to close with a great warning from this chapter, 2 Peter chapter 2. Children of God, not all that glitters is gold. Just because someone sells a lot of Christian books and packs a stadium and has a big church does not mean they are sound teachers 
of God's doctrine and lovers of God. Earthly success is not an indication that God is blessing that teacher. Okay, and that is real a deception within Christianity. Well, God must be, look at all those people they have, or look at all those decisions, or look at all that, whatever. God must really be blessing them. Really? Really? I tell you a lot of wicked people that have huge followings. And it doesn't mean that God is blessing them. Be discerning about the message and the man himself, his fruit. Beware of slurpy, sweet, smiley preachers that seem to be able to offer you something that is better than anything you can find in your local church or anything you've ever seen anywhere else. Beware. Be willing to separate from heresy. I also warn you about influences in this church. Look for the warning signs of influencers in this chapter, okay? And I'll just go back to remind you a couple of things this morning. They share feigned or molded teaching and opinions that are not the same as Bible doctrine. They speak evil of good things, all right? They are willing to go and to complain and to be negative and to speak against good things. They take advantage of people for their own self, their own influence. They're hurtful of the genuine love in the church. They're disrespectful to authorities. They're presumptuous and arrogant. They're impure. They have swelling words, etc. And I would just say to you, these are, those are all things out of the, the text. Not all that glitters is gold. Distance yourself from such dangerous influencers. I warn you, we go on to the next chapter, chapter 3 the next time, I warn you that the main reason for 2 Peter chapter 2 is that these guys are not somewhere out in la-la land. These are creeping privately into your church. I don't want to scare the tar out of you. I just want to scare the tar out of you. Would you stand, please? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven.